So embankment slope stability, I'll talk to you a little bit about, is pretty complicated. It requires consideration of the full plausible range of soil behavior um, and the likelihood of different types of behavior which may occur uh, as a result of the type of loading we expect. So the rate of loading um, and the level of loading. So the objectives of this module are to uh, talk about uh, slope stability issues that may affect that risk of breach and to provide some guidance on the consideration of the factors that go into an analysis. So selection of soil strengths, what pore water pressures to use, um, and what loading considerations uh, to consider uh, in order to do a slope stability analysis for a risk assessment. Again, a little bit different than what we would do um, versus <clears throat> looking at a, a design. Uh, so, um, this slope stability analysis we would do um, and the uh, parameters we select uh, really are dependent on the formational processes, so the geologic depositional processes, the stress history, so soils you may or may not know have a story to tell. So when we talk about stress history, we're talking about um, what the soil is telling us about what it's experienced in its in its depositional history. Has it been preloaded or is this is the load that we're considering right now the most load that, that um, soil has ever seen? Um, if that's the case, that's what we call over consolidated versus normally consolidated. Normally consolidated means the soil is currently experiencing um, more load than it's ever seen in its history. Over consolidated means previously it experienced a, a heavier load um, and the soils will behave differently based on where in its, its history of stress um, we, we are. So generally, uh, we're considering whether a soil is dense or stiff based on where it is in its stress history or loose or soft. Um, loose or normally consolidated soils tend to contract when they're subjected to shear forces. And so they're, they act in a... Um, we have to consider how the, how the poor water pressure is being dissipated. So if um, the poor water pressure is being dissipated quickly, we call that a drain condition. If it's not being dissipated can, quickly, such that the soil isn't able to uptake all of the, the load, we call that um, an undrained condition. So for drain strengths, um, we use what's called an effective stress approach. That's how we look at the soil strength. For undrained strength, we use total stress approach where we don't need to know uh, very much about what the poor water pressure is. In the Corps of Engineers uh, pro, uh, portfolio, we have seen a few slope instability issues. Um, we do evaluate the condition, the stress condition for stability during construction and at the end of construction. Um, and also during what we call rapid drawdown conditions. So when a, an embankment is loaded with a, to a certain stage and then is quickly, that stage is dropped, that affects how the soils react. Um, reclamation has also had a few uh, instability issues, but one of the best examples of a slope instability in the course portfolio um, is shown here uh, at Fort Peck Dam. Um, so this was a pretty massive um, slope instability that occurred back in 1938. Um, the size of this slide, I think we have a clicker. Um, the size of the slide is about uh, a quarter section, so that's 160 acres. That's a really big um, area of, uh, of, oh, thank you. Please, there's the circle. <laughs> Thank you, Darcy. So that's that's a quarter section if you're thinking about what a, a topo map looks like. Um, there are about 180 workers working currently. It was while it was under construction um, and um, including the construction engineer who was on the embankment at the time it was able to escape without harm. Um, so pretty uh, dramatic slope stability failure. So um, you can see the, get a sense of the deformation. Um, there were some drag lines here that were uh, dislocated to about where that um, yellow comment marker is. Um, so quite a bit of deformation. And you can also get a sense of the directionality of the slide. So this is the right abutment and the um, 
the slope instability kind of tends to pivot around uh, that right abutment into the into the um, the reservoir. So the volume of that slide is about um, five million cubic yards, which is a little bit more than the entire volume of concrete placed in the Hoover Dam, which was constructed uh, just a couple years prior to this. So I don't know if you've been to the Hoover Dam, but it's like really massive. Um, so this volume of material that, that moved was um, equivalent to the size of the Hoover Dam, the volume of the Hoover Dam. So I think that is a great demonstration that slope instability um, can be a problem. So we need to be thinking about some key information in order to consider um, how our slopes are going to behave when we're thinking about risk. So some key information when we're doing uh, slope stability evaluation um, that we need to keep in mind are the, like, we talk, like I mentioned before, the shear strength of the soil materials, the geometry and the geology. Is there anything that's gonna limit a slide um, based on the geometry of the geology? Uh, what stress conditions are we evaluating? Um, and what pore water pressures are we evaluating? So there are several things that can trigger slope instability. Um, water being one of the primary things, whether it's um, water being introduced at the crest of a dam through cracks or because of poor drainage, um, whether we uh, add load or remove resistance. So we can remove resistance through something like an inadvertent excavation at the toe or erosion that occurs at the toe of an embankment that would remove the resistance force um, or a, a surcharge loading at the crest that increases a driving force. Like I talked about before, a rapid drawdown condition where we had water um, and the water's drawn down enough such that, that we no longer have the water on the water side, but the soils don't know that and they think they're acting like they still have water there. There's excess pore water pressure and the strengths are reduced because of that. Um, also changes in seepage or groundwater regime can affect the strengths of soils and how they react in a stability. Um, analysis, excavations, as I talked about, or any other conditions that would change the stress condition um, in the structure can be triggers. So these next few slides, they come from the um, levy design and construction manual. So that's uh, 1913, EM 1913. And just to walk through a couple of the conditions we think about in looking at uh, slope stability analysis. Um, so right here we're showing um, the end of construction case, so T equals zero, construction just completed. Um, so here we're, we're gonna wanna use a normally consolidated undrained strength assumption for free drain, if, if the soils are free draining, if they're um, sands and, and gravels, we would use the drain, the drain strength. So for case two, we're looking at that rapid drawdown or sudden drawdown condition. So for free draining granular soils, we would use drain strengths. Um, but for low permeability soils, we would uh, address this from a th in a three-stage approach. Um, the first stage being using effective stresses. Um, the second stage using undrained shear strength. So we're thinking about uh, where we are in the history of this embankment, where the water has been and how the soils are, are gonna react from a strength perspective. Um, and then the third st stage uses drain strengths or, or effective stresses um, or undrained strengths, total stresses, depending on which condition it results in, in a worse condition. Um, and this could vary along the slip surface. So we're kind of, for this sudden drawdown condition, we're sort of trying to juggle a few, uh, a few conditions and figure out which one results in our, in our worst case scenario. So for case three, we're looking at a flood loading scenario where the embankment has been in place for a while, but we subject it to a load. So similar to the other two cases, if we're looking at free draining soil condition, we're using drain strengths, but for low permeability soils wet of critical with an over consolidation ratio of less than two to about four, um, we're using drain strengths, but for low permeability soils, dry of critical with an over consolidation ratio of two to four, we use the drain strength. So again, that speaks to the, 
the, the stress history of the soil, if, it, if we're subjecting it to loads that are much higher than the soil has experienced in the past, we consider that quite differently than if um, those, those, the loads we're seeing are much lower than um, the materials been, been, has experienced in its past. So the last case we look at is a seismic loading condition, um, and I'll reference uh, ER 1806 for how we evaluate slope stability um, for seismic cases. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in the week, but it's really an evolving um, analysis um, to how we look at embankments under seismic loads. So this also is a table that comes from 1913. It's a summary, um, again, summary of what, how we look at pore water pressures for drained soils, which are highlighted in blue, and for undrained soils, which are highlighted in red, uh, how we look at poor water pressures and how we look at um, the uh, soil strength conditions for the various cases I presented um, in graphic format. So we can't really talk about slope instability without talking about Hurricane Katrina and some of the, the breaches that we saw um, in the New Orleans Parish uh, during, as a result of the, the hurricane um, loading. So specifically here, we'll talk about the 17th Street Canal breach, um, which was of, of attributed to embankment or eye wall instability. So after Hurricane Katrina, there were some forensic analyses done uh, by the Interagency Performance Evaluation Task Force, also called the IPET group. So they were deployed to, perform, to perform that forensic analysis uh, to understand better how the system performed under the load subjected uh, by the hurricane. Um, so one key takeaway from this report is that um, the undrained strength for these soils that were in place soft, wet of critical, the undrained strength was the controlling factor, which wasn't how those, um, those uh, <clears throat> eye walls and levees were designed. They weren't designed for those strengths. So there were some key differences observed between the strengths assumed during the design and the strengths that were evaluated as part of the, the forensic analysis. So you can see on this plot on the left, or maybe, maybe you can see it, but I can point it out. There's an orange line here there's also a red line and a, and a blue line. The red line um, represents the strength values um, calculated by the IPET modeling under the center, center line of the levee. The blue is under the toe, and the orange is the, are the design values, the, the values that were used in design. So you can see um, the red dashed line, which defines the strength profile beneath the center line based on the IPEP forensics, that it matches pretty well with design at depth. In fact, the, the lines are very close. You can't even discern them. But at the toe, there's quite a difference. The strength at the toe was quite a bit lower um, than was estimated in the design. So that's the reason why those eye walls um, didn't perform very well. Um, they weren't really designed to account for the real stress condition that the soils were experiencing. So kind of shine so, some light on uh, some of the uncertainties, oops, we have to think about in trying to determine what strengths to use when we're evaluating risk. So some major sources of uncertainty are listed here. Um, we have some challenges in translating shear strength from laboratory tests to in-place tests. That's kind of a, something we've talked about from a structural standpoint earlier. How, what, you know, how do you decide what strength to use? How do you um, consider which strengths are reliable for what loading condition? Um, and then also understanding the long-term strength. Um, and how to characterize that. Again, there's an analog in the structural stuff that we talked about yesterday with Cody. Um, is there strength gain? Is there strength lost? Um, and actually uh, assessing what the actual poor water pressure con conditions are um, in the analysis that you're considering. So just another quick case history. Um, let's look at the Dallas floodway. This is uh, the Dallas floodway in 1990 during a flood, obviously. Um, and uh, just highlight some of the facts, some important performance issues that factored into uh, some slope stability evaluations for this system. Um, so from a risk standpoint, this is a more current picture of the Dallas floodway. Um, 
and I think we could probably all agree it's very populated, right? So um, the population plays into, uh, obviously that's the last part of our risk equation, right? The consequences. So when we're in such a densely populated area behind levees, um, that, that growth really has an effect on the, on the, the risk level associated with a system like this. So back in that flood in, in um, or along this, uh, this floodway, there are a couple factors that contribute to slope instability. Um, and those include uh, saturation from storm events um, and um, <clears throat> slides that result as a result of, of that saturation. Um, we're able to identify some of these slides uh, because there was some pretty good surveillance offered by the Dallas Police Department with their, their air support um, that allowed uh, to identify the locations, but some of the temporary repair efforts weren't successful despite being able to see those from the, from the air. Um, one, other fa one other factor other than saturation um, for embankment instability that is really important from a risk standpoint is to consider encroachments. So this is an example of a, a location where there was a leaking water main that crossed uh, over the levee. Um, it was supposed to have been abandoned, but it wasn't. Um, the, the abandonment couldn't be completed because of some faulty valves, so that introduced water where there should not have been water and resulted in an instability. So when we're looking at levee systems, um, one of the things we really need to consider when we're talking about risk are whether there are features like this or other features that have de may have destabilized the toe of, a, of an embankment uh, to consider um, whether an instability, uh, a, a new uh, instability has been introduced to the system. So just that's just some kind of quick stuff on embankment slope stability. Um, if anybody has any questions, don't ask me about critical state soil behavior theory. I was trying to relearn it last night, I'm too old. Um, does the core ever get involved with transient analysis and risk? For a versus steady state. Yes, so I would say the rapid drawdown condition is is a good example of that, um, where we're considering. Maybe that's not quite what you mean by transit, but we're considering where we are. Um, as far as the phreatic surface making its way through the levee. To yeah. The steady state condition. Right. So that's a condition where we're not considering it at steady state. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So that's an important point, is when we're looking at an, uh, a levee system or an embankment, we need to consider um, for a particular failure mode, what is the loading condition? Where's the phreatic surface um, for that specific failure mode? So for Dallas, did that extended dry period get, get desiccation cracks that exacerbated the problem when you had all the rains? You know, I don't know that specifically for certain, but I, I have to say probably, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Manel. Good discussion on slope stability of embankments.